Hello everybody, welcome back to another video with me, Miss Martins. We're going to carry on with going through past paper questions, exam questions. So if you like videos like this, please give this one a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Today we're going to focus on wave, sound and light and as you can see we'll be going through some of the questions in this past paper. Let's get right into it. Now I'm going to start you off with some multiple choice questions and as you know in physics and chemistry, the first 10, 5 to 10 questions are always going to be multiple choice questions and sometimes they can be quite tricky. So this one says the maximum displacement, okay, displacement is basically a distance of a particle from its rest position is known as its amplitude. Okay, so if you have a rest position like this, this is known as the rest position. If I draw in a wave that looks like this, that is the maximum displacement of a particle between its rest position. Okay, the maximum displacement is known as the amplitude. Next question, 1.2, which one of the following statements is true? So they're telling me which one is the most true, well, only one of them. So sound waves can travel in a vacuum. Sound waves are electromagnetic. The speed of sound waves is always constant. The pitch of a sound wave is dependent on its frequency. Okay, so we know that electromagnetic waves travel in a vacuum. Sound waves are longitudinal waves and they require a medium to travel through. So that's water, air, something like that. Sound waves are not electromagnetic waves. Sound waves are longitudinal waves, so it's not that either. The speed of sound waves is always constant. That's not true. We know the speed of light is constant. The speed of light is 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. But the speed of sound waves differs depending on the medium. So therefore, our answer is D. The pitch of a sound wave is dependent on its frequency. And we know if we have a higher frequency, we're going to have a higher pitch and vice versa. 1.3 they say the diagrams below represent two sine waves, A and B. Just be careful because this one over here is B and this one over here is A. Which one of the following combinations that compares the frequency and loudness of A with B is correct? Now, two things. Frequency. Frequency. And loudness. Loudness is related to amplitude of the wave. Okay, and amplitude is the maximum displacement of a particle from its rest position. So that is the amplitude. Versus here, this one is the amplitude. So based off of loudness or amplitude, we can el already eliminate some options. So we can see that the, these are plotted on the same grid, basically, same little grid spaces. A has a much larger amplitude, therefore it has a larger or a greater loudness. Okay, so loudness of A is greater than B. So immediately that means that B, option B, and option C are wrong. Okay, because the loudness of A is definitely greater than the loudness of B. Then we're going to look at frequency. So we know that frequency is related to the period of a wave. Now frequency is the number of waves that pass a given point in a second. Okay. And the period is the time that it takes to complete one full wavelength. Now, if you look at the blocks that they've given, they've given us exactly the same number of blocks in B as in A. We don't know the time that is passing between here and here. But what we can see is that in B, there's one, two complete wavelengths between the starting point and the ending point. For A, same thing, one and two two wavelengths. So because of that, the frequency and the period of these waves are the same. So that means that this is the correct answer. 1.4, which one of the following statements best describes the behavior of an electromagnetic wave? And if you study electromagnetic waves, if you study your definitions and how an electromagnetic wave propagates, you will know that el the electric and magnetic fields vibrate perpendicularly to one another. Okay, that's it. Now, question two, we can see that we are dealing with pulses P and Q. It says that they're traveling in opposite directions in the same medium. Pulse Q travels to the left. So you, here's an arrow indicating that Q is going to the left. And they say opposite directions, which means P is going to the right. The amplitude of pulse P is three centimeters. We can see that indicated on the diagram. 
and that of pulse Q is unknown. We don't know what that is. The two pulses meet at point X. Okay, so there they're going to be in this, at the same space and at the same time. And when that happens, we know the principle of superposition will come into play. Okay, so X, when they meet, this is illustrating what happens at point X. So we can see that X has an amplitude of 5 centimeters and it's going downwards like that. Okay, so just to show you, P was 3 centimeters up, Q was an unknown number of centimeters down, principle of superposition we have where they meet at x five centimeters down first of all we're going to define the term pulse quickly so that is our first question a single disturbance in a medium that is a pulse and we know that a wave is made up of a series of pulses a series of disturbances a train of pulses what type of interference takes place at x well we can see that p was going up at an amplitude in the positive direction, so let's just call this in the positive direction of 3 centimeters. Q had an amplitude going down, unknown. But this would be a negative if I'm taking positive as up and negative as down. And Q is down with 5 centimeters. So that means that there was some cancelling out going on. There was destructive interference going on. Okay, so destructive. You get constructive and destructive interference. Right, determine the amplitude of Q. So we don't know what it is, remember, it's unknown at the moment, but now we want the amplitude. So basically what we're gonna do, just ignore that little at. What we're gonna do is we're gonna say, well, three was in the positive direction. Q, I don't know. And then X where they met was negative five. And you might say, okay, whoa, 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 ma'am, why are you saying negative five? Well, remember, I said in order to determine Q, I'm going to pretend that upwards, like this, is a positive number. Q in the opposite direction would be a negative number. I'm not putting the negative in there because I'm solving for Q. Five is going downwards, so it's going to be a negative number. If I take, if I'm solving for Q and I take three over, look what happens. It's going to be negative five minus three. So Q will be negative 8, and all that means is that the amplitude of Q is 8 centimeters, and it's going down like that. You could have done the other way. So you could have said Q, the amplitude of Q, plus the amplitude of P, that's going to give me X. If I said, okay, X is 5, and P is negative 3, because it's going in the opposite direction, then Q you would get exactly the same answer, but you would get, you take the negative three over and it would become positive three. Five plus three is eight centimeters. You see what I mean? So it doesn't matter how you get there. Just be aware that if this is going three up and then some unknown number down and we made five, it means that this had to have been going eight centimeters down. Okay. 2.4 says a learner states that immediately after the pulses at P and Q meet at X, pulse P will move to the left. Is the learner's observation correct? So let's just um, revisit the original directions. Q was in initially moving to the left. P was initially moving to the right. When they meet and the principle of superposition comes into play over here, destructive interference happened. And then they're going to continue moving in their original directions. So P will carry on moving to the right. So the answer here is no. Your reasoning over here is according to the principle of superposition, pulse P will continue moving in its original direction, which is to the right, not to the left. Question three. The following wave pattern is produced by a wave that takes 2.5 seconds to complete one wave cycle. Now, very important, before I even read further, we know that the time taken to complete one wavelength or one wave cycle, that is known as the period of the wave, T or period. So they are giving us the period, which is very nice because we know if they give me the period, I can then work out the frequency because frequency is one over period. And this can be helpful because if I know the frequency, 
I can always work out the wave speed or the wave length. So just keep those things in mind. But I know period. Yay, that is awesome. They give me the wave direction, which is helpful. They label some points on the wave. But look at this important piece of information. A particle at point B, Natavia, vibrates at 90 degrees to the direction in which the waves are moving. So the wave is moving this way. The particle is going to vibrate at 90 degrees. So we know a wave in which the particles vibrate at right angles or perpendicularly to the direction of the motion of the wave. That is known as a transverse wave. So they actually ask which type of wave is indicated in the diagram above. And that is a transverse wave. If they had to ask for a reason, you will basically quote this over here. The particles are vi vibrating or moving at 90 degrees to the original, well, to the direction of the motion of the wave. Okay, so that is a transverse wave. Remember, longitudinal waves or sound waves are when the particles vibrate parallel to the direction of motion of the wave. Give one reason why a particle at B will be out of phase with a particle at C. Now, the reason why they'll be out of phase is because particle B and particle C are moving in opposite directions or different directions. And to illustrate this, I drew the wave, the original wave, a moment in time later. So if you don't understand what I'm saying is if this, if I had to label this part, this um, crest over here, E, this would be E a moment later in time. And this would be B a moment later in time in terms of the, the wave. So the wave is moving this way. Okay. So that peak is shifted there. That peak is shifted there because the wave is moving. But remember, the particles don't move. They go up and down. So if a moment later in time, this wave has moved from here, going down like that, to here, going down like that. Do you see B would have moved up because the wave is going to be here. B will only moves up and down, remember? Um, they move at 90 degrees. So B was here, and then a moment later in time, will, B will be here. And it'll go down, and it'll go up, and it'll go down, it'll go up. C was here. A moment later in time, C will be over here. Because remember, they travel perpendicularly. Um, so C will go down and up, down and up. So B will go up a moment later in time. C will go down a moment later in time. So out of phase, out of phase is your answer. And the reason is because... B and C are moving in different directions. When it comes to in phase and out of phase, another thing to remember is uh, if particles or your particles in phase will occupy the same position on the wave. So all the particles along here, they will be in phase because they're all along the crest. The particles over here will all be in phase because they're all along the troughs. And so on and so forth. Just remember that if that's a little bit easier. Um, and particles in phase will move in the same direction. Particles out of phase will move in opposite directions. Determine the frequency of this wave. So remember earlier on we discussed that 2.5 seconds to complete one wave cycle. That is the period. That is T, the period. Frequency is equal to 1 over period. This is on your formula sheet. You might see it in this form. It's the same thing. Reciprocals, they are reciprocals of one another. So if I want to determine frequency, frequency is equal to 1 over period. So 1 over 2.5. So you put your formula, you substitute, and 1 divided by 2.5 is 0, 0,4 hertz. Remember your unit, please. That's your answer with unit. 3.4 gives me the speed of the wave. So they say if the speed of the wave is 0, 0,08 meters per second, so that is V. The speed of the wave is V, 0, 0,08 meters per second. Calculate the value of X in meters. Okay, calculate the value of X in meters. Now, first of all, we know that the value of X is kind of related to the wavelength. So remember, a wavelength is the how long one wave is so the distance between two consecutive points so that would be the wavelength from a to that position over there but the question doesn't want the wavelength it wants from here to here so we would have to ask ourselves how many wavelengths occupy that distance and remember why am i talking about wavelengths because we want x in meters so if we're looking for 
distance in this plane like this from one point of a wave to another point of, of a wave over here. It's related to wavelength. And if I have period frequency, speed of the wave, I can calculate wavelength. If I know that there's one in here, one and three quarters of a wave in this space over here, if I have the wavelength, then I can multiply the wavelength by one and three quarters in order to get that full distance. I hope that makes sense. So my first step is going to be calculate the wavelength. So if you look at my formulas, V is equal to frequency times wavelength. I'm going to use that formula in order to calculate wavelength. I have frequency from the previous question. I have speed from the previous question. So we write down our formula, we get our formula mark. We substitute in velocity or speed of the wave, which is 0, 008. Frequency is 0, 04 hertz. And then I can find wavelength. So just remember to find wavelength, you say 0, 008 divided by 0, 04. I need to get rid of this, divide, this 0, 04. Currently it's multiply. So you do the inverse, which is divide. So 0, 08 divided by 0, 04. And I get the wavelength as being 0, 0,2 meters. Now remember, as I mentioned, wavelength, that's the distance between two consecutive points in phase. It's one wave. So one wave I highlighted here in green. So basically between A and this point over here, that distance would be 0, 0,2 meters. That distance. So the distance between this spot and this spot but I don't want that distance I don't want a wavelength I want the distance between these two dotted lines here those two so basically if I can figure out, out how many wavelengths are between these two red lines I can take that number and multiply it so I as I've mentioned that's one wavelength then a second wavelength would be from here to here but clearly, we're going to cut it off before it gets to the second wavelength. So that, that would be a half if I go up like this. That would be a half. This would be a quarter. So a quarter, another quarter, and a third quarter. I hope you can see what I mean. So three quarters of a wave. So this is one full wave, and this is three quarters of a wave. So therefore, distance x is equal to 0, 0,2, so that's one wavelength, the distance for one wave, times by 1 and 3 quarters. 1, 75 is basically 1 and 3 quarters. And we get 0, 0,35 meters. Just be careful because if they asked for x just as is on the diagram, you would have to convert it to millimeters because you see it says X millimeters, but they didn't ask for that. If you read the question, they say X in meters. So we're all good with that being our answer. So we'll get a formula mark, substitution mark. You'll get an answer over here and then you'll get your final answer mark over here for multiplying it by the number of waves in that space over here. 3.5 asks, how long in seconds does it take for a particle move from point A, which is over here, to point D? Now remember, we have the period, period in seconds, and that is the time that it takes for one wavelength or one wave cycle to complete. So one wave cycle takes 2,5 seconds. So if I want to know how long it takes to go from here to here, I can basically figure out how many wave cycles or how many wavelengths are in this space from A to D. And then I'll take 2.5 and I'll multiply it by that number. So let's have a look. We have, this is one wave. Let me use different colors to kind of highlight the different numbers of waves. So that's wave number one. That's wave number two. That's wave number three. And then we've got an extra little bit over there. And if you look carefully, and if you think about it carefully, that is half a wave. I know it's half a wave because if I were to continue that, there, that would be a full wave. So from two consecutive points. So if I start at the equilibrium position and I come back up, okay, that would be one full wave. But I don't have that piece. I only have a half. So that's one wave, two wave, three wave, and a half a wave. So we have 2.5 is the time that it takes to complete one wave. And we have 3.5 waves.
and that gives me 8,75 seconds. Again, if you don't give me your units, you're not going to get the mark. Question four, we can see, is all about sound waves. And sound waves are longitudinal waves. Just we can keep that piece of information in the back of our mind. Longitudinal. Okay. They speak about the fact that the ship sends out sound waves and they give me the frequency. Just remember that one kilohertz is 1000 hertz. That may or may not be helpful later. And we have a receiver attached, attached to the ship and it detects these waves a short while later. So if you think about it, we have a ship on water. It's sending out sound waves to the bottom of the sea. So there goes the sound waves. And then the sound waves are going to come back and hit the detector on the ship again. This is called an echo. Um, and the first question actually asks, what is an echo? So an echo is a reflection of a sound wave essentially and they give me the speed of sound in water so that is v remember the speed of sound in air is different to the speed of sound in water etc so an echo is a reflection of a sound wave off of a surface there we go two marks for a definition essentially then they want us to calculate the wavelength of these waves. Remember, wavelength can be represented by this symbol, which is called lambda. It's a little funny squiggly thing. And in order to calculate the wavelength, we use this formula. You should be familiar with this formula at this point. So V is speed of sound, which we have. It's 1,500. Frequency we have. It's 25 kilohertz. But when we use frequency in this formula, it needs to be in hertz. So 25 kilohertz is equal to 25,000 hertz. Remember, we multiplied by 1,000 because there's 1,000 hertz in 1 kilohertz. So we've got 25,000 hertz. And then we can get wavelength. Remember that wavelength would be 1,500 divided by 25,000. The wavelength is 0, 0,06 meters. Please remember your unit wavelength is measured in meters. 4.3 asks if these sound waves can be heard by the human ear. Give a reason. This is part of your study work. You do need to know the different frequencies that human ears can detect um, and the frequencies that we call ultrasound and those things. But essentially, the answer here is no. The frequency is beyond the range for the human ear. 4.4. They want us to calculate the depth of the water beneath the ship if the waves are detected by the receiver 10 seconds after being admitted. So I'm just going to redraw our picture here just to re-explain. So what I've done is I've listed the variables that we know already and I've drawn a picture of the ship, the ocean floor. So remember the, the ship is going to send out sound waves of a certain frequency, 25,000 hertz. It's going to hit the bottom of the, the ocean floor and it's going to reflect off of the ocean floor um, it's an echo back up to the ship um, and it says it takes 10 seconds for the ship to receive that sound again. So what's important to know is that if it takes 10 seconds overall, okay, and we assume that the ship hasn't gone up or down relative to the ocean floor, that means it'll take five seconds to reach the ocean floor and five seconds to go back up to the ship. Now, why do I care about that? Well, if I want to know the depth of the water beneath the ship, I'm looking for this distance over here. We call it delta x or change in position or displacement. It's basically the distance or the depth. So that's what I'm looking for. Now, if I'm looking for that depth, I know that I can use this formula. Speed is equal to distance over time. Speed is equal to distance over time. Now, if I'm looking for the distance between the ship and the ocean floor, the time that I would use would be five seconds because it takes five seconds to go from the ship down to the ocean floor. It doesn't make sense to use 10 seconds because that would represent double the distance. So I can use this formula. I say that the speed of sound in water is 1,500. The distance is what I'm looking for. And my time would be five. To get my answer, I say 1,500 multiplied by 5, and I get 7,500 meters. You may see this formula in the form of speed 
is equal to distance divided by time. Either way, it's the same formula. Or speed is equal to distance divided by time, something like that. This is the more proper way to do it. When you do mechanics, equations of motion and all those things, you will use it in this form. So there we go. That's where you get your four marks from. Formula, halving the time, substituting into the correct formula and your answer with units. Question five is about electromagnetic waves. Okay. And we know that they travel through a vacuum. They all travel at the same speed, which is the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the power of 8 meters per second. First question says, briefly explain what is meant by the dual nature of electromagnetic radiation. So dual nature means it acts in two ways. And basically we should learn, it's part of our theory, that light behaves as a wave and as a particle. Right. Name the type of electromagnetic radiation that is used to sterilize medical instruments. Now, again, this is part of our theory work, but we know that ultraviolet waves, ultraviolet waves are used to sterilize medical instruments. Okay, you also know these as UV waves, but rather just spell out the full word. Ultraviolet waves have quite a high frequency and therefore a high energy. Remember, E is equal to, that's a constant, times frequency. So if your frequency is high, your energy is high. If you have a high energy, that allows us to actually kill bacteria, sterilize medical instruments. Which electromagnetic radiation has the longest wavelength? That would be radio waves. So you do have to learn the order of the electromagnetic radiation, the spectrum. So as you can see over here, we've got a spectrum. We've got radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible light, UV rays, x-rays, and gamma rays. On this end of the spectrum, wavelength is the longest. So radio waves have the longest wavelength because they have the longest wavelength, they have the lowest frequency. Just remember that frequency is inversely proportional to wavelength. Okay, so that means if you have a long wavelength, you have a low frequency. Okay, or if you have a very long or short wavelength, you have a high frequency. Um, and then over here, we have gamma rays that have the shortest wavelength. Look at all these little waves here. But the highest frequency, which means they have the highest energy, which means that they're, most, they're the most dangerous because they have the highest penetrating ability. Okay, So you can see that they use in medicine for killing cancer cells. They're ultraviolet rays, which we just discussed, is used to sterilize medicine. You know that if you get an x-ray done, you have to wear protective gear that protects the other parts of your body and your tissues from being damaged and destroyed. But we know that radio waves and microwaves are relatively safe. Um, we use radio waves um, in our phones and our radios and our TVs and things, and it's relatively safe. It's not going to penetrate us and damage ourselves. They say state one danger of ultraviolet light. Well, we said because it has a relatively high frequency and energy, it can damage cells. It can cause cancer and skin cancer and things like that. Ultraviolet light, we know, is also found in sunshine, so it's very dangerous. A photon of an electromagnetic wave has a wavelength of 700 nm. Now, you need to know that wavelength is usually measured in meters, and that's what we need to convert to. But they might give us wavelength in other units of measure because these wavelengths are tiny. Okay, so we can get micrometers, we can get nanometers, we can get picometers, we can get millimeters. All of these things require a conversion. If it's milli, you must divide by a thousand or multiply by 10 to the negative three. If it's micro, so that's a funny looking symbol, you multiply by 10 to the negative six. If it's nanometers, like in this question, you need to multiply by 10 to the negative nine. If it's picometers, that's the smallest, you must multiply by 10 to the negative 12. Okay, this is super important. If you don't convert to meters, you're going to get it wrong. So they want the energy associated with this photon. Remember, a photon is a packet or a pocket of, of um, energy found in light. And we can measure the energy of a photon with this formula. We also know that the speed of electromagnetic magnetic waves, which is represented by the symbol C, is equal to the frequency of the wave multiplied by the wavelength of the wave. So C is equal to frequency times wavelength. The reason why I'm showing you this is because in this question, we are given wavelength. 
So we're given wavelength. Okay, we are we know the speed of light. The speed of um, yeah, the speed of light is three times ten to the eight. The speed of all electromagnetic radiation is three times ten to the eight. That's on your formula sheet. So with this formula, we can calculate frequency, and then once we have frequency we can calculate energy. So it's almost like a two-step calculation, which makes sense because it's five marks. There's also a formula that combines this one and this one. It is usually given on your formula sheet. It's E is equal to Planck's constant multiplied by the speed of light divided by lambda. So you can see that that combines this and this formula. Okay, because frequency for this formula frequency can be written as c divided by lambda and that is substituted into this formula so in the place of frequency they substitute c divided by lambda and that gets you h c divided by lambda so i'm going to use this combination formula but you may do two separate formulas just remember that if you're doing two separate formulas do not round off in the middle of the calculation Okay, so I've written down the things that we know. Just take note that these are constants, so these are found on your data sheet. You don't have to memorize those off by heart. Please look at your data sheet when writing these down, so you make sure you don't make mistakes. And just remember, this is 6,63 times 10 to the negative 34. You must make sure you write that in properly. Okay, so we know H, we know C, those are constants. We know wavelength, but just remember, this can't be in nanometers, it must be in meters. So like we discussed, it's 700 times 10 to the negative 9 meters. So this is the version I'm going to use in my formula. Then we substitute. When you substitute, please use brackets. Especially when it comes to scientific notation, I need you to be using brackets in your calculator because sometimes if you don't use brackets in your calculator, it kind of freaks out and it does the wrong thing. Lambda is 700 times 10 to the negative 9. Lambda is wavelength. You type that into your calculator, use brackets, type everything in perfectly, press equals, and we've got 2,84 times 10 to the negative 10 joules. It really does not matter if you work it out perfectly and you get this number if you don't put the unit, the correct unit. Because if you don't put the correct unit, if you don't put a unit in at all, you're not going to get your answer mark. So in this formula, you'll get a formula mark. You'll definitely get an answer mark and you will get three substitution marks. For 5.5, they want to know how will the energy of this photon be affected if the wavelength is decreased? Now, they want you to choose from these three words and then give a reason. Please don't forget to actually give a reason if they ask for a reason or you're only going to get half of your marks. So if we look at the formula, it's always helpful when they ask you these questions in science. Like, what happens to this if I change this? You have to look at the mathematical relationships in the formula. So if I decrease the wavelength, this over here is wavelength. They want to know what happens to the energy. Now, this is an inversely proportional relationship. And how do I know that it's inversely proportional? Because the wavelength is underneath the fraction. It's divide by wavelength. So what that means is if I make this number bigger, if I make wavelength bigger, E is going to get smaller. Think about it. If I have, say it doesn't matter what the number is at the top of the fraction. Say I make the number on the top of the fraction 1. It doesn't really matter what it is. And let's say I make the wavelength 2. 1 divided by 2 is a half. So the energy is a half, 0, 0,5. If I decide to keep the top of the fraction the same, which it will be because these won't change, these are constants, but I make the wavelength bigger. So instead of 2, it's now 3. 1 divided by 2 is a half, 0, 0,5. 1 divided by 3 is 0, 0,33333. Do you see that as I make the wavelength bigger, E gets smaller. And in the same way, if I make the wavelength smaller, so if I make the wavelength smaller, E will get bigger. That is the relationship. It's called the inversely proportional relationship. So the energy will increase. Your answer is increase. So you'll write increase. And the reason is energy is inversely proportional to wavelength. 
and I just added in here, if C and H are constant, so if these two things stay the same, then energy is inversely proportional to wavelength. Another way to write that in symbols is energy is inversely proportional to wavelength. So as soon as you put something over, one over something, that means inversely proportional. There are more past paper or exam questions like these linked in the description. Please let me know what else you'd like to see in the comments below. Should I do a part two of wave, sound and light? What other topics would you like to see? Let me know and make sure you subscribe for more videos like this in the future and turn on the little notification bell so that you don't miss when I upload. See you guys in the next one.